Chapter 9 Luckily, just before night, all four of us had lashed ourselves firmly to the fragments of the windlass, laying in this manner as flat upon the deck as possible. This precaution alone saved us from destruction. As it was, we were all more or less stunned by the immense weight of water which tumbled upon us, and which did not roll from above us until we were nearly exhausted. As soon as I could recover breath, I called aloud to my companions. Augustus alone replied, saying, It is all over with us, and may God have mercy upon our souls. By and by both the others were enabled to speak. When they exhorted us to take courage, as there was still hope, it being impossible from the nature of the cargo that the brig could go down, and there being every chance that the gale would blow over by the morning. These words inspired me with new life, for, strange as it may seem, although it was obvious that a vessel with a cargo of empty oil casks would not sink, I had been hitherto so confused in mind as to have overlooked this consideration altogether, and the danger which I had for some time regarded as the most imminent was that of foundering. As hope revived within me, I made use of every opportunity to strengthen the lashings which held me to the remains of the windlass, and in this occupation I soon discovered that my companions were also busy. The night was as dark as it could possibly be, and the horrible shrieking din and confusion which surrounded us it is useless to attempt describing. Our deck lay level with the sea, or rather we encircled with a towering ridge of foam, a portion which swept over us even instant. It is not too much to say that our heads were not fairly out of the water more than one second and three. Although we lay close together, no one of us could see the other, or indeed any portion of the brig itself, upon which we were so tempestuously hurled about. At intervals we called one to the other, thus endeavoring to keep alive hope, and render consolation and encouragement to such of us as stood most in need of it. The feeble condition of Augustus made him an object of solicitude from us all, and, as from the lacerated condition of his right arm, it must have been impossible for him to secure his lashings with any degree of firmness. We were in momentary expectation of finding that he had gone overboard, yet to render him aid was a thing altogether out of the question. Fortunately, his station was more secure than that of any of the rest of us, for the upper part of his body, lying just beneath a portion of the shattered windlass, the seas, as they tumbled in upon him, were greatly broken in their violence. In any other situation than this, into which he had been accidentally thrown after having lashed himself in a very exposed spot, he must inevitably have perished before morning. Owing to the brig's lying so much long, we were all less liable to be washed off than otherwise would have been the case. The heel, as I had before stated, was to larboard, about one half of the deck being constantly under water. The seas, therefore, which struck us to starboard, were much broken by the vessel's side, only reaching us in fragments as we lay flat on our faces, while those which came from larboard, being what are called backwater seas, and obtaining little hold upon us on account of our posture, had not sufficient force to drag us from our fastenings. In this frightful situation we lay until the day broke so as to show us more fully the horrors which surrounded us. The brig was a mere log, rolling about at the mercy of every wave. The gale was upon the increase, if anything, blowing indeed a complete hurricane, and there appeared to us no earthly prospect of deliverance. For several hours we held on in silence expecting every moment that our lashings would either give way, that the remains of the windlass would go by the board, or that some of the huge seas which roared in every direction around us and above us would drive the hulk so far beneath the water that we should be drowned before it could regain the surface. By the mercy of God, however, we were preserved from these imminent dangers, and about midday we cheered by the light of the blessed sun. Shortly afterward we could perceive a sensible diminution in the force of the wind, when, now for the first time since the latter part of the evening before, Augustus spoke, asking Peters, who lay closest to him, if he thought there any possibility of our being saved. As no reply was at first made to this question, 
we all concluded that the hybrid had been drowned where he lay. But presently, to our great joy, he spoke, although very feebly, saying that he was in great pain, being so cut by the tightness of his lashings across the stomach, that he must either find means of loosening them or perish, so it was impossible that he could endure his misery much longer. This occasioned us great distress, as it was altogether useless to think of aiding him in any manner while the sea continued washing over us as it did. We exhorted him to bear his sufferings with fortitude, and promised to seize the first opportunity which should offer itself to relieve him. He replied that it would soon be too late, that it would all be over with for him before we could help him, and then, after moaning for some minutes, lay silent when we concluded that he had perished. As the evening drew on, the sea had fallen so much that scarcely more than one wave broke over the hulk from the windward in the course of five minutes, and the wind had abated a great deal, although still blowing a severe gale. I had not heard any of my companions speak for hours, and now called to Augustus. He replied, although very feebly, so that I could not distinguish what he said. I then spoke to Peters and to Parker neither of whom returned any answer. Shortly after this period I fell into a state of partial insensibility, during which the most pleasing images floated in my imagination, such as green tops, waving meadows of ripe grain, processions of dancing girls, troops of cavalry, and other fantasies. I now remember that, in all which passed before my mind's eye, Motion was a predominant idea. Thus I never fancied any stationary object, such as a house, a mountain, or anything of that kind. But windmills, ships, large birds, balloons, people on horseback, carriages driving furiously, and similar moving objects presented themselves in endless succession. When I recovered from this state, the sun was, as near as I could guess, an hour high. I had the greatest difficulty in bringing to recollection the various circumstances connected with my situation, and for some time remained firmly convinced that I was still in the hold of the brig, near the box, and that the body of Parker was that of Tiger. When I at length completely came to my senses, I found that the wind blew no more than a moderate breeze, and that the sea was comparatively calm, so much so that it only washed over the brig amidships. My left arm had broken loose from its lashings, and was much cut about the elbow. My right was entirely benumbed, and the hand and wrist swollen prodigiously by the pressure of the rope, which had worked from the shoulder downward. I was also in great pain from another rope, which went about my waist and had been drawn to an insufferable degree of tightness. Looking round upon my companions, I saw that Peters still lived although a thick line was pulled so forcibly around his loins as to give him the appearance of being cut nearly in two. As I stirred, he made a feeble motion to me with his hand, pointing to the rope. Augustus gave no indication of life whatever, and was bent nearly double across a splinter of the windlass. Parker spoke to me when he saw me moving, and asked me if I had not sufficient strength to release him from his situation saying that if I would summon up what spirits I could, and contrive to untie him, we might yet save our lives, but that otherwise we must all perish. I told him to take courage, and I would endeavor to free him. Feeling in my pantaloons pocket, I got hold of my penknife, and after several ineffectual attempts, at length succeeded in opening it. I then, with my left hand, managed to free my right from its fastenings, and afterwards cut the other ropes which held me. Upon attempting, however, to move from my position, I found that my legs failed me altogether, and that I could not get up, neither could I move my right arm in any direction. Upon mentioning this to Parker, he advised me to lie quiet for a few moments, holding on to the windlass with my left hand, so as to allow time for the blood to circulate. Doing this, the numbness presently began to die away so that I could move first one of my legs and then the other, and shortly afterward I regained the partial use of my right arm. I now crawled with great caution toward Parker, without getting on my legs, and soon cut loose all the lashings about him, when after a short delay 
he also recovered the partial use of his limbs. We now lost no time in getting loose the rope from Peter's. It had cut a deep gash through the waistband of his swollen pantaloons and through two shirts and made its way into his groin from which the blood flowed out copiously as we removed the cordage. No sooner had we removed it, however, than he spoke and seemed to experience instant relief, being able to move with much greater ease than either Parker or myself. This was no doubt owing to the discharge of blood. We had little hopes that Augustus would recover, as he evinced no signs of life, but, upon getting to him, we discovered that he had merely swooned from the loss of blood, the bandages we had placed around his wounded arm having been torn off by the water. None of the ropes which held him to the windlass were drawn sufficiently tight to occasion his death. Having relieved him from the fastenings, and got him clear of the broken wood about the windlass, we secured him in a dry place to windward, with his head somewhat lower than his body, and all three of us busied ourselves in chafing his limbs. In about half an hour he came to himself, although it was not until the next morning that he gave signs of recognizing any of us, or had sufficient strength to speak. By the time we had thus got clear of our lashings, it was quite dark, and it began to cloud up, so that we were again in the greatest agony lest it should come on to blow hard, in which event nothing could have saved us from perishing, exhausted as we were. By good fortune it continued very moderate during the night, the sea subsiding every minute, which gave us great hopes of ultimate preservation. A gentle breeze still blew from the northwest, but the weather was not at all cold. Augustus was lashed carefully to windward in such a manner as to prevent him from slipping overboard with the rolls of the vessel, as he was still too weak to hold on at all. For ourselves there was no such necessity. We sat close together, supporting each other with the aid of the broken ropes about the windlass, and devising methods of escape from our frightful situation. We derived much comfort from taking off our clothes and wringing the water from them. When we put them on after this, they felt remarkably warm and pleasant, and served to invigorate us in no little degree. We helped Augustus off with his and wrung them for him when he experienced the same comfort. Our chief sufferings were now those of hunger and thirst, and when we looked forward to the means of relief in this respect, our hearts sunk within us as we were induced to regret that we had escaped the less dreadful perils of the sea. We endeavored, however, to console ourselves with the hope of being speedily picked up by some vessel, and encouraged each other to bear with fortitude the evils that might happen. The morning of the fourteenth at length dawned, and the weather still continued clear and pleasant, with a steady but very light breeze from the northwest. The sea was now quite smooth, and, as from some case which we could not determine, the brig did not lie so much along as she had done before. The deck was comparatively dry, and we could move about with freedom. We had now been better than three entire days and nights without either food or drink, and it became absolutely necessary that we should make an attempt to get up something from below. As the brig was completely full of water, we went to this work despondently and with but little expectation of being able to obtain anything. We made a kind of drag by diving some nails which we broke out from the remains of the companion hatch into two pieces of wood. Tying these across each other and fastening them to the end of a rope, we threw them into the cabin, and dragged them to and fro in the faint hope of being able to thus entangle some article which might be of use to us for food, or which might at least render us assistance in getting it. We spent the greater part of the morning in this labor without effect, fishing up nothing more than a few bedclothes, which were readily caught by the nails. Indeed, our contrivance was so very clumsy that any greater success was hardly to be anticipated. We now tried the forecastle, but equally in vain, and were upon the brink of despair when Peters proposed that we should fasten a rope to his body and let him make an attempt to get up something by diving into the cabin. This proposition we held with all the delight which reviving hope could inspire. He proceeded immediately to strip off his clothes with the exception of his pantaloons, and a strong rope was then carefully fastened around his middle, 
being brought up over his shoulders in such a manner that there was no possibility of it slipping. The undertaking was one of great difficulty and danger, for as we could hardly expect to find much, if any, provision in the cabin itself, it was necessary that the diver, after letting himself down, should make a turn to the right, and proceed under water a distance of ten or twelve feet in a narrow passage to the storeroom, and return without drawing breath. Everything being ready, Peters now descended into the cabin, going down the companion ladder until the water reached his chin. He then plunged in head first, turning to the right as he plunged, and endeavoring to make his way to the storeroom. In his first attempt, however, he was altogether unsuccessful. In less than half a minute after his going down, we felt the rope jerked violently, the signal we had agreed upon when he desired to be drawn up. We accordingly drew him up instantly, but so incautiously as to bruise him badly against the ladder. He had brought nothing with him, and had been unable to penetrate more than a very little way into the passage, owing to the constant exertions he found it necessary to make in order to keep himself from floating up against the deck. Upon getting out he was very much exhausted, and had to rest full fifteen minutes before we could again venture to descend. The second attempt met with even worse success, for he remained so long under water without giving the signal that, becoming alarmed for his safety, we drew him out without it, and found that he was almost at the last gasp, having, as he said, repeatedly jerked at the rope without our feeling it. This was probably owing to a portion of it having become entangled in the balustrade at the foot of the ladder. This balustrade was indeed so much in the way that we determined to remove it, if possible, before proceeding with our design. As we had no means of getting it away except by main force, we all descended into the water as far as we could on the ladder, and giving a pull against it with all our united strength, succeeded in breaking it down. The third attempt was equally unsuccessful with the first two, and it now became evident that nothing could be done in this manner without the weight of some weight with which the diver might steady himself and keep to the floor of the cabin while making his search. For a long time we looked about in vain for something which might answer this purpose, but at length, to our great joy, we discovered one of the weather forechains so loose that we had not the least difficulty in wrenching it off. Having fastened this securely to one of his ankles, Peter now made his fourth descent into the cabin, and this time succeeded in making his way to the door of the steward's room. To his inexpressible grief, however, he found it locked, and was obliged to return without effecting an entrance, as, with the greatest exertion, he could remain under water no more, at the utmost extent, than a single minute. Our affairs now looked gloomy indeed, and neither Augustus nor myself could refrain from bursting into tears as we thought of the host of difficulties which encompassed us, and the slight probability which existed of our finally making an escape. But this weakness was not of long duration. Throwing ourselves on our knees to God, we implored his aid in the many dangers which beset us, and arose with renewed hope and vigor to think what could yet be done by mortal means toward accomplishing our deliverance.